Nelson to you. I am Joshua, and we are here again on another Friday evening. And I'm grateful for everybody out there. I see the Tommies are there, and the Fair family, and Fair family and friends, I should say. And I see Sister Luz. I don't know off the top of my head who Shining for Jesus is behind that screen name. But welcome, and I'm sorry that I can't remember who that is. I have a thought about who it might be, but I'm not going to guess. A couple quick announcements, and then we have a sermon tonight on a, a weekend that I think many people celebrate Easter, and wherever you're at with that, I'm not going to beat you up one way or the other. It is um, celebrated by many people to acknowledge and sort of remember the sacrifice that Jesus performed, gave on our behalf and the resurrection that came after it. And there's a lot of controversy over it, so I'm not going to get into that, but we will. I will say something about something tonight. The name of the sermon tonight is Watch Your Mouth, and that is probably a reflection of James chapter 3. The subtitle of that entire chapter could easily be called Watch Your Mouth. Like, that would be a perfect heading for that chapter. A couple quick announcements, and we'll pray. Happy Sabbath, Brother Kenneth. Um, next week, we're going to be in Concord, Arkansas. So we'll be there. We are leaving Thursday. Get there Thursday night. We'll be there Friday, Saturday at least. And how many more days? I'm not sure yet. But I'm definitely preaching there. Uh, we'll have a live stream next Friday evening like this. But there will probably be other people and the, there'll be a different background. And um, then Sabbath morning, Saturday morning, we'll have fellowship there and I'll be preaching at Concord Church. I'm excited about that. There's it's a wonderful place. And there is a bunch of kids, a bunch of kids down there. So we're excited about that. Um Brandy had it. There was another announcement. Oh, the camp meeting. I better tell you about that. The camp meeting has a solid theme and I need to make some announcements. I'll be preaching I believe two messages and emceeing sort of master of ceremonies type of thing. Um, it's Burn Bright's meeting. And then you'll also have Matt Dooley and the Dooley family are coming. Matt Dooley will be preaching one message for sure. And Demario Carter and the Carter family are coming. And Demario is preaching one message for sure. Now there is a specific theme for the meeting. Um, the Lord has need of it and he has sort of pressed me. Like, Joshua, this is what the meeting's about. Speak what I bid you. And uh, the meeting theme is God is good all the time. And that may seem to you <clears throat> an empty platitude, because it is for most people. Most people say God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. It's as deep as a mud puddle. Most people don't really uh, ever think about it. We're going to slow down and have a meeting that really enters into the spirit of that, that God is good all the time and sort of touches on the irrefragability of God's goodness, the irreducibility of it, and the wonderful way in which God works. Now, the announcement is that the meeting is just, what are we, barely a month away, is that right? A lot of stuff going on around here. I'm swinging hammers at bright side, 12 hours a day sometimes, 14 hours, and then all of this too. So there's a lot of excitement. We're about a month away from the camp meeting. Two cabins just got filled up today. We have less than half the cabins left. If you would like to come, we would love to have you. The food is free. The fellowship's free. Everything is free except the cabins. The cabins are 45 bucks a night for four nights, May 8, 9, 10, and 11. So it's 180 45 bucks a night, but if you can find a cabin or a hotel room for that price anywhere in the country, let me know, because that's not what they actually rent for. So they're basically giving the cabins away to us. Um, anyway, we would love to have you. We have less than uh, half the cabins left, so I'm not trying to um, like manipulate you, but if you please book soon, because they're going to fill up probably. And if you would like to come, please do. We would love to have you. Uh, there's going to be a kayak canoe trip on Thursday. There's a kayak and a pontoon boat. We'll be out on the, I think, the Tennessee River. 
and that's a three-hour trip. There's an island with a beach there that we're going to stop at, Lord willing, weather permitting. Thursday will be Family Fellowship Day, so we will have musical concert, worship, and it's, I think it'll be great. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the theme of the meeting, God is good all the time. And it's more than just cliches. It's going to be, I think, spiritually cathartic and good. If you can make it, we would love to have you. The food is taken care of. All the food will be free. Um, if you have special dietary needs, bring your own food. Like, I don't mean that in a mean way, but you know how people are. They have every, they, you, When you have that many people, somebody has something they can or can't have. So, All right. What else? Somebody asked last week, and I'm, I apologize on advance. My hands are... Like, I'm not, I was kind of cut up from working on the construction out there. So, I don't mean that to be a distraction. That's a sore. I don't have something on my hand. I cut my hand on the deck yesterday. Um, somebody asked last week, how can we donate to the ministry or something to that effect? Or two people asked or something. We need to figure out a way. I'd just be blunt. We need to figure out a way to drop something in the comments here. We have PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, and... There's another one. I don't remember the name of it. Um, if you're interested, we will definitely receive the support because we are behind continually in that area. Um, traveling costs money. Car insurance costs money. Things cost money. So we'll figure out, for those that asked, a way to drop something in the comments. Well, I know who you are, Shining for Jesus. I knew it was you. I'm sorry. I looked at a comment. It says, I have four children in living Kentucky. I know exactly who you are. All right. I thought it might be so. Happy Sabbath, Ricky Venn. Uh, we'll figure out a way to drop the information there. But we do have PayPal, Venmo, and all that. If you want to support the ministry, we're not supported by any denomination or organization. Grassroots. And when the Lord says go, we go. That doesn't always financially make sense. And uh, so those several that asked, um, we would be grateful and we will figure out how to get something in the comments. Happy Sabbath, Melissa Barra. All right, I've rambled like seven minutes. My apologies for that. But if you can't come to, if you can come to the camp meeting, we would love to have you. And if you can't, we still love you. Other thing is the YouTube numbers have been up. The number of viewers. We have had... Uh, a significant increase on the live streams and a lot of times it's young people hallelujah uh, and sometimes it's people who are belligerent or a little angry or whatever don't get upset with them they're welcome here and we will talk to them and ask Christ to talk to them um, we were all that person at some point in our life so if we catch any seagulls tonight of people that come in and say hateful things um, Let's give them what they need instead of what they deserve. Let's pray for them. And um, after all that rambling, I'm sure that we're done with comments now, except to say, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. We're at 600 and a most unfortunate number of subscribers, 666 subscribers, because somebody uh, subscribed this week and it put us right on that number. We've been getting 30 or 40 subscribers every week, but... If you haven't, it would do us a big favor and either one person unsubscribe or one person subscribe. Now, I'm not superstitious and I don't really care, but I'll tell you, some people are superstitious. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Well, welcome in, Layden. Layden Kirkland is here. Welcome and welcome to Krista Shadow. Happy Sabbath to you and your lovely husband. Happy Sabbath, Lori Pickett. Let's have a word of prayer and we will get into our study. Our gracious Heavenly Father, forgive our sins, forgive our trespasses, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, we pray for your spirit, your presence. Bless us, Lord, with these object lessons that will bring the kingdom of God in our hearts that will enrich our lives and our existence which will give us meaning and purpose. Bless us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn with me, please, to James chapter 3, if you have your Bible. 
I had this out last week. Guess what? We're going to talk about this a little bit again because there was a big national event this week, and I think most people probably saw it. <clears throat> I'm going to read James 3, verses 2 through 4. This is James, the brother of Jesus, sometimes called James the Just, a really righteous dude. James the Just. He did what was right even when nobody was looking. They eventually killed him, threw him off the temple. Uh, I think it's Eusebius or the other uh, scholars of an antiquity have written accounts of James's martyrdom. They basically said, tell us that Jesus isn't the son of God and we'll let you live. And he said, I can't do that. He is the son of God. Now, no one could raise any complaints with James. That's why they call him James the Just. He was a righteous dude. They threw him off the top of the temple, crippled him, and then the temple guards came up, and the historical accounts say they beat him to death with clubs. And as that was happening, he said the same thing as Stephen said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. James the Just. So I take the man's testimony very serious. He sealed it with his own blood. Chapter 3, verse 2, he says, In many things we offend people, but if any man doesn't offend in his speaking, with his words, if he can control his mouth, that is a perfect man who is able also to control his whole body. Behold. Now, when it says behold in the Bible, that means look. It means pay attention. It means picture it in your head and see it. With the inward eye. He says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, and that tiny little bit, you put it in a horse's mouth, and it makes them obey you. And you can turn a whole horse this way or that with that tiny little thing in their mouth. Verse 4, James says, Behold, look at the ships, which even though they're huge, humongous ships, and driven with power and fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small rudder, whithersoever the pilot turns it. Behold also the ships, which even though they are humongous and really big, and they are driven of fierce winds and power, yet they are turned about with a tiny little rudder. Now, this is a sort of scale replica of the Queen Mary cruise ship, the Queen Mary II. It's a big old ship. But even those huge ships have a tiny little rudder. You can see the size of this guy, right? And then you see this rudder, and there's some, uh, there's some African migrants there that are escaping their country sitting on the rudder. A tiny little rudder. Small as those people almost, isn't it? Not really big compared to the cruise ship. Now, as you know, this week, a humongous freight ship, that's a cargo ship that holds storage containers, lost control, and it smashed into a major bridge in Maryland. You probably saw it on the news, and it hit it with such power and force that it caused the entire bridge to collapse. Now, the weight of that container ship was immense. We are talking millions and millions of pounds. It's the type of huge ship that's made for the oceans. And it hit one of the pillars of the key bridge there in Baltimore, and then it took out the entire bridge, just demolished the whole thing. As somebody asked how it was possible that a ship could take out a, a bridge, and then there was a physicist, like a mathematician, who did the math on it. And he said it was basically the equivalent, because of how humongous that boat was, he said it was the mathematical equivalent of a loaded train going 80 miles per hour, running into a car stopped on the train tracks and expecting that the car was going to stop it or something like that. That's the math of it. Well, just how does something like that happen? That a humongous container ship could take out a major bridge like that? Well, it's a very interesting and a very biblical lesson. You see, the ship, uh, according to one of the experts that was commenting on the video, the ship was beginning to make a turn to go under the bridge, and if you watch the video, at a most unfortunate moment, the ship loses power. Right when it starts to make the first turn, the ship loses power, and when they lost power to the ship, they lost power to the rudder, 
Now the rudder is that tiny little piece that steers the whole ship. And because they couldn't control that tiny little rudder, losing control of that little thing caused them to lose control of the entire ship and demolish the bridge. Now the book of James warns us of just such an occurrence. It says, behold also the ships, even though they're big, huge ships. It says, yet they have this tiny little rudder. In whichever direction that rudder turns, it turns the whole ship. James says, look at the ships of the ocean. Even though they're humongous, even though they are huge, the entire thing is steered by this very small rudder. And he says, if you don't control that rudder, it's going to cause the entire ship to go in a direction that you might not want. And James is speaking an allegory to communicate a metaphysical lesson. And what is the metaphysical lesson that James is teaching? Well, he tells us right there in the very next verse, verse 5. He says, your rudder is like a tongue. He says, even so, your tongue, even though it's just as small as a rudder is to a ship, even so, your tongue is a little tiny member of your body. It boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles. In the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and set on fire the course of generation and is set on the fire of hell. Now, that's some extreme talk. But James is saying, in essence, that even though your tongue is small, you can make shipwreck with it. He says, you see, like if you didn't control the rudder of a boat, you make shipwreck. Even though that thing is tiny, It'll destroy things around you. You can end up destroying yourself. Now, right before this, James says, in many things we cause offenses. And, but he says, if you see a man or a woman who does not harm or otherwise hurt people with their tongue, you're looking at a perfect soul. Because a person who has rule over that clearly can rule the whole rest of their being. That's what James says in verse 2. And in James 3, he's driving home the importance of controlling your tongue. Now, the heading of James 3 in your Bible could easily be called, Watch Your Mouth. Watch Your Mouth. Because the entire chapter, written by a man who sealed this chapter with his own blood, is telling you again and again the seriousness of, of your tongue. Even though it's a small thing, just like the rudder of a boat is small, and your words might just be a few syllables, he says the rudder is the major thing steering the boat. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Should we take James serious? I think we should. He wrote an entire chapter about it. Let me pause here. We have some comments. Welcome, Consumer Advocate. Welcome, Stephen Rollins. He says, the tongue is a little member, but the words it frames have great power. Absolutely. Red Bunny Classic, welcome back, and happy Sabbath. Thank you for coming. Now, at the end of the chapter, chapter here, which could easily be labeled, Watch Your Mouth, James lays out a very high calling for the sons and daughters of God. He tells you what to aim for in verses 17 and 18, which were verses I memorized early on as a Christian. He says, um, but the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that is from above, this is the heavenly GPS, so to speak. This is when you know that it is, the word there in Greek is Sophia, the wisdom of God. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now that's like a bookend, if you could picture a set of bookends. You have the bookend at the beginning of the chapter, before the whole chapter, the very bookend at the beginning, James says, you see somebody can control their tongue, they're perfect. If they can do that, they can easily control their whole body. 
And then the, oh, the closing bookend of the chapter is this note right here when he says, The wisdom that's from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. He says those seven things are emblems and hallmarks of someone who's in the spirit and in the light. Those are clear indicators that the rudder is being steered by that heavenly pilot, Christ. James starts the chapter one way, telling you the seriousness of it. And it stuns me of the importance that James puts on the tongue. Now, our Lord says nearly the same thing in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 6, uh, and I think it's 45, he says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know that verse? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, James the brother of Jesus, is saying the very same thing that Jesus says. Now, it's true that in this world there are often liars and phony people who sort of flatter and connive with their tongue and that their words don't really reflect what's going on inside of them. But our Lord tells us that more often than not, what people speak reveals what's really in their heart. And we find out in life that sooner or later, the people who flatter you, people who are phony with you, they can't always lie. And sooner or later, they end up speaking in a way that uh, what's really inside of them comes out of them. And maybe you've heard this before. When you squeeze a Christian, Christ should come out. And it is often that trials and difficulties reveal your true character that hard situations reveal what's really going on inside of you. Now, our Lord tells us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. James says the rudder is a tiny little piece of the boat. It steers the whole thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's kind of like saying you don't have to eat an entire 10-gallon pot of soup when a spoonful taste is enough to reveal what's inside the whole pot. Did you get that? You don't have to eat a 10-gallon pot of soup when a spoonful is enough to reveal what's down there in the pot. And our Lord is telling us, and his brother's telling us, that your tongue is a revelation of what's going on in your heart, that your words are like a tablespoon that let other people taste what's really on the inside of you. Now, let me ask you a hard question. What do others taste when you speak? Do they taste goodness, purity, peaceable gentleness? Do they taste mercy and good fruits by the way you talk to them and the things you say? Do they taste words that are without partiality and without hypocrisy? Or when they get a spoonful of you talking, are your words seasoned with grudges, hatefulness, resentment? Bitterness, envy, strife, ignorance, and fear. Well, you don't have to eat a whole 10-gallon pot of soup to know what's in it. You only need a teaspoon to reveal that. And our Lord's brother here, James, tells us in the very same way, the rudder of a ship is a very small thing, but it reveals, not only does it steer the ship and cause it to go this way and that, it reveals which way the ship is going. If a rudder points what direction a ship will go, let me ask you a question. Where do your po words point that you're going? To shipwreck spiritually or to paradise spiritually? Now, this week that freighter made shipwreck and smashed a bridge, and all of that happened because that humongous boat lost control of that tiny little rudder. I sometimes hear people say that they wish they could speak multiple languages. They want to be polyglots. There's nothing wrong with that. I hear people say they wish they could speak with the tongue of angels. But I often think it would be best if people would master speaking English first and get good at speaking English, if that's their mother tongue, in a way that is loving and gentle and peaceful, good, intelligent, wise, and uplifting. Why do you need to know Italian if you can't speak English in a holy way? Why do you want to speak with the tongues of angels if you haven't mastered speaking in a holy way with the human tongue? I think, brothers and sisters, if you have the kingdom of God and the fruits of the Spirit in English or French or whatever your mother tongue is, then you're going to take those things into other areas that God sees fit to give you. But if you can't steer a dinghy, you can't steer a cruise ship, 
if you can't control the rudder on a John boat, the Lord probably ought not trust you with the rudder on a barge or a great carnival cruise line or something like that. And I think that it is quite incumbent upon each of us as Christians to learn to use our words in a way that glorifies God, that that little rudder of the tongue, when we speak, speaks words that are loving, gentle, peaceful, good, intelligent, wise, and uplifting. Let me pause and look at some comments. Evelyn Ivey says, It's better, but then it becomes sweet as a honeycomb. Well, I'm not sure what that was in reference to. Uh, but I pray that, it, that our words are seasoned with a certain pleasantness. The Bible says pleasant words are sweet like a honeycomb, bringing moisture to the bones, bringing health to your marrow. And it's talking a deep spiritual lesson there. It says there's this contagious thing that spreads and it actually heals souls when you speak kindly to people. Now, I think there's good reason you should want to speak in a way that glorifies God. Well, for one, if you don't control that little rudder, you're going to make shipwreck. That's a terrible way to go through life. You know, I see people that, uh, you ever see bumper bowling? <laughs> that occurs to me right this very moment. Bumper bowling where they put those things up and they roll the ball and it's just bing, 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 off of one side, off the other. And <laughs> I know people that way that speak that way going through life. They're bouncing off one conversation to the next, bumping in from one argument to the next, one problem to the next, and they're always having shipwreck. Steadiness is a good thing. Have you ever had spaghetti in the microwave? Hmm, interesting thing about that. You heat up spaghetti in a microwave, it gets hot really quick. But it doesn't get exactly hot really quick. It doesn't get uniformly hot. It's the strangest thing. Kenny's smiling, you might know what I'm talking about. You eat a bite of spaghetti from the microwave, one bite of it will be so hot, you it'll like burn your mouth, right? Another bite of it will be ice cold. And I know people that are just that way with how they talk. They're either, you know, super loving or super hateful or super this or super that. It's night and day with them. There's no steadiness there. Imagine if you were on a cruise ship and the guy in charge of the rudder was like, we're going this way, we're going that way, and he's just whipping the thing back and forth. Well, you'd probably get seasick, wouldn't you? I think you'd get seasick. It's a terrible way to go through life not having rule over your tongue. And if you don't have rule over your tongue, the Bible tells us very plainly that's a revelation that something else has control of your whole being. But a person who does have Christ in their lips, in their tongue, in their syllables, that is a revelation that Christ has their whole being. I think you could measure that. I think it is a measurable thing. Now, it is always easier to rule over other people than it is to rule over ourselves. But I think the thing that really impresses Christ in the kingdom of God is when we gain control over our own tongues and you control the rudder so that you're not making shipwreck again and again and destroying things. Now, gaining control of how you speak and how Christ speaks through you is a spiritual exercise. It's performative. It's going to... Mm, this is a seminary word, performative. You know what that means. The Gospel of Thomas is performative. Do you know what that means? It means that he intends for you to take a part in it. Like, he doesn't give you the answer. Like, you read the Gospel of Thomas. It's a Gnostic Gospel. There's a lot of mystic stuff in it. And it's considered a performative Gospel because Jesus says something in it, and he expects you to try to figure out what he's saying because something in the performance of trying to figure out the riddle of what he's saying will reveal something to you. Now, gaining control of your tongue like the rudder of a boat is a spiritual exercise that is performative because it begins to invoke a certain dominion over your own soul in Christ's name. It's drawing a line in the sand and conquering. It's saying, Christ, come in here and get this. It, because it causes you to become aware of Christ. It causes you to become aware of the light. It causes you to become aware of Christ moving into your life. And it's a spiritual exercise. But as I said, it's always easier for us to rule over other people than it is for us to rule over ourselves. But Christ is impressed when we partake of these performative spiritual exercises, which are in the scriptures. Now, people say, well, I'm spiritual. I'm not illegal. That's legalism. You don't know what you're talking about. If you will do the simple things 
these simple things that Christ asks you to do, he'll give you more. And he'll give you more. And sometimes he'll give you so much, you'll say, that's enough. That's enough, please. That's enough. I don't need any more. Uh, let me get a comment here. Stephanie, I think it says Stephanie Clayton. Welcome, Stephanie. She says, I know better. Why am I struggling to do better? Thank you for your inspiration. Well, Stephanie, thank you for joining. And subscribe and come here and see us every week and we'll talk about it. Well, you know what I think, Stephanie? The only road to found is lost. Romans 7 is a, exactly the description of what you're saying. In Romans 7, Paul says, look, man. He says, I got all these things that I don't want to do and I know I shouldn't do them. And then he says, right when I know I shouldn't do them, I end up doing the thing. And he's like, I know I don't want to do the thing. Then I do the thing. And then I feel terrible about having done the thing. And at the end of the Romans 7, he is completely miserable. And he says, who can help me? Oh, wretched man, who can save me from this? this is terrible. Going through life, sinning and repenting is, is miserable. It's miserable. But here's the good news. Romans 7 comes before Romans 8. Romans 7 is part of the gifting as God is gifting you with his Holy Spirit. There's a process of cleansing that takes place. Now, I'm going to say something that is true, and I'm not trying to flatter you. I'm speaking the truth as it is in Jesus. Stephanie, the fact that you know that you want to do better is an indicator that the Holy Spirit is very present with you. Very present. I would be troubled only if you didn't know you needed to do better. The fact that you know you need to do better in some area or another is an indicator that God is working on you and that he's doing something marvelous. It is an indicator that the Holy Spirit is present with you. Here's the hardest part, yielding to that nudge. James 4 and 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's two parts. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Resisting the devil is like, I'm not doing this again. I'm going to let Jesus have his way. And there's a nudge and an impression. Lord, is that you telling me shut up? But I don't feel like shutting up. I want to say the thing loud. And God says, well, shut up. <laughs> and so the nudge is to hush sometimes. The nudge is to, mm. James says, look here. He says in verse 9, you bless God with your mouth, even the Father, and with the same mouth you cuss, cuss men, you curse men, which are made in the image of God. He says it not be so. He says, what bush do you know grows good fruit and poison fruit on the same bush? What spring do you know gives healthy water and poisonous water from the same spring? He says it ought not be so. So he's saying make a choice. Choose what you want to do. Now, the very fact, Stephanie, that you have an unction, it's wonderful. God's going to finish what he started. He's going to. And the very fact that you have an unction at all, like I just keep whatever it is, the thing going on. You said, I know better. Why am I struggling to do better? Thank you. That's part of the growing process. And I would suggest to you, not cliches or platitudes, but things that I have proven to be true. Kites only rise against the wind. Is that true? It's against the opposition that kites rise. And sometimes God is calling you to higher places, and there is a, an opposition, a pressure. There's a push. And you say, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, then pray. Don't get on your knees and pray. Do that too. Get on your knees and pray sometimes. Uh, but pray them ambulance prayers. You know, I was weeping this morning in prayer. And I don't say this publicly to get cookies or something, but just to give you a glimpse of my life spiritually, I have fervently prayed, and this is not an exaggeration, I would think a few thousand times in seven years, like fervently, like Gethsemane type weeping for someone to be delivered, weeping for something to be moved, and pleading with God fervently and earnestly. I don't know if you get extra credit for that, and I don't mean that in any way, but uh, before you can have something, you got to really want it. And in my prayer closet, I often find what I really want because I listen to what God really wants. 
And besides those fervent prayers, which sometimes could last 45 minutes or 30 minutes or 28 minutes or an hour and a half, and I'm walking through some woods somewhere on a trail just praying fervently for something, and it comes to pass, it's amazing. Sometimes you can feel something just break loose in somebody else's life. And you're praying for them and praying for them. And you can just feel something break loose. And you know they're going to make it. It's wonderful. It's not a small thing. And for those that think prayer is a fairy tale, well, a lot of them prayers in churches are. When the guy gets up there and just says the things, and it's just a form. Uh, but I would tell you that intercessory prayer is very fervent. And the other part that I was going to mention was this. Not only are those prayers, ambulance prayers. Pray ambulance prayers, Stephanie. You should probably say, I already do. You know what an ambulance prayer is? You don't got time to get fancy. There ain't no time for that now. <laughs> you know, we need to get the anesthesia in here. We need to get this in here. We don't have time. You know, the surgeon jumps in the room. He goes, there's no time right now. We got to go. Ambulance prayer is you're on the line at Walmart, and this happened, this happened. Pray. Mm -hmm. Keep your mouth shut and pray. Talk to God. And if I've prayed a thousand or several thousand fervent prayer sessions over the years of seven years, I have prayed tens of thousand ambulance prayers. And it's not the number, brothers and sisters, and I'm not boasting about how much I pray. I'm trying to give you a glimpse of, like, things that work. Ambulance prayers work. You get slapped in the face. You're going to see that coming? You ain't going to see it coming. You drive all the way to some faraway place and do something, and you're helping people, and somebody smacks you in the face for no reason. And you say, whoa, these people are out of line. Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven on them? <laughs> and before you say any of that, you pray. You pray ambulance prayers. Lord, what will you have me to do? That's the first thing to pray. Christ, I need to hear your voice. What do you want me to do, Christ? I don't want to hear from anyone else. I want to hear from you, Christ. What do you want me to do? Pray those ambulance prayers. Ask for Christ to help you. Ask and you shall get it. And you'll just... Uh, it's like tuning in a radio. It will come. Stephanie, it will come. And God will... There'll come a day when you look back and you'll have so many good things in your life. And so many victories spiritually that you'll, it'll be hard to believe you were ever the other way. Like, God has done this. Isn't this glorious what God has done? Well, James is asking us to attain to this spiritual exercise. And I would not suggest to you that it's legalism that James is involved in. I would not suggest to you that it is some empty thing of trying to work your way to heaven. I would suggest to you that it is a performative thing that opens the gates of heaven when you do it. He says, look, man, a rudder's small. You don't control that. Boats make shipwreck. Your tongue is small. But if you, if you learn to control that, conquer that area, whew, sky's the limit. Now, I would briefly touch on three biblical concepts. Just quickly touch on them that might help empower you to gain control of that rudder, that thing that James says your tongue is like a rudder, and maybe you can have some fewer shipwrecks this week, this month, this year, and move a little closer and closer with Christ. The first one is this. It's been said there are two types of people when it comes to the tongue. There are people who have something to say, and there are people who just have to say something. Do you, know, do you know the difference? There are people who have something to say, and then there are people who just have to say something. They just have to blurt something out. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, which, by the way, is the only billboard number one song written by a biblical author, Solomon, uh, chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, was covered by the birds with the hit song written by Bob Dylan, so-called, uh, Turn, Turn, Turn to Everything. That's a number one hit billboard song there by Solomon, Ecclesiastes 3. It says, there is a time to speak and a time to keep quiet. There is a time to speak and a time to be silent. So one of the first biblical concepts to empower you to get control of this little rudder so you quit making shipwreck is there's a time to be silent. Maybe I can help you with that. When Jesus was accused, a righteous man was accused by the Pharisees. They're 
What did he say in his defense? It says he stood there silent. He didn't rail on them. He just let them think whatever they were going to think. He said, well, that's fine. They thought whatever they thought. They've, they believed something evil. That's their choice. They'll have to reap that. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't defend himself. He sit there quiet. Now, I have often heard, Stephen says, even a foolish man can seem wise when he keeps quiet. That's absolutely correct. That's a wonderful proverb. I have often heard the phrase, peace and quiet. Have you ever heard that phrase, peace and quiet? And it seems to me that those two words are inextricably intertwined. That in many cases, peace and quiet are connected. But we live in a generation that seems to be afraid, or at least unfamiliar with that second word, quiet. And because they're unfamiliar or maybe afraid of that word quiet, they don't have peace. From the cradle on, from the moment we're born, this generation especially, we are bombarded with screens, with bells and whistles, with horns, with loud trucks and supermarket music. Modern society is a cacophony of noise. It's a bedlam of loudness and competing decibels. But the Bible talks about a still, small voice. What an interesting concept. You know, a single voice is intelligent. But the noise of a crowd quickly degrades and erodes into meaningless noise. Picture this for a minute. Think about it. You're in an auditorium and maybe a theater or there's going to be a symphony coming up, you know, and they haven't taken the stage yet. And you're in this crowd and there's hundreds and hundreds of people in the crowd and you're sitting there waiting for the symphony to start and everyone is talking in the crowd at once. What does it sound like? There's meaningless noise. There's hundreds of voices at once and it's meaningless noise. A single voice is intelligent. Maybe you remember your school lunchroom. Do you remember that? Mm. You remember how it sounded in your lunchroom in public school? The larger the crowd, the noisier it gets and the sound quickly turns to meaningless noise. On the other hand, a single, still small voice is intelligent, comparatively, for sure. Now, I know so many folks that tell me, they say, but I wish I could hear the still small voice of God. But so many in this generation seem like they're afraid and they seem to fear nothing so greatly as these two words, peace and quiet. Think about that. The TV is always on in their house bellowing out whatever commercialized dreck is seeping into their living rooms from it. It's as though it would be a fearful thing to just have the TV off and it be quiet in the house. Like, it's like, just come in, turn TV on, you know, like just turn it on and let it run. And the TV is always making noise in the house. Peace and quiet. And if it's not the TV, then maybe it's social media. Social media is always belching out the constant sputtering spasms of superficial people. People who stutter out these three line long posts, which are about as deep as a mud puddle, completely superficial, like a rock skipping across a pond. People on social media spend more time sharing their opinions than they do forming them. So if the TV is not spewing out noise continually, then social media is belching out this constant stuttering spasms of three line posts of someone is raged and someone's this and someone's that and really all of this stuttering spasms of social media are nothing more than a revelation of the insecurities and immaturities of the shallowest parts of the world's soul most people on social media spend more time sharing their opinions than they do forming them and if it's not the constant uh, glaring noise from television or the belching noise of immature people on social media, then there's the carnival atmosphere of the grocery store with noisy music, busy parking lots, flashing lights. You go down the bread aisle and even pretzels are being sold under bright colored flashing lights with a half-naked woman. And you say, man, who would have thought that just buying canned goods would require me swimming through an ocean and flood of such noise? Children are growing up in this world and they think it's normal. Some of us grew up in this world and had to learn very painfully that it's not normal. I feel deeply um, for autistic children mm -hmm. 
and I don't think they're so weird. I think they're just like, what the heck is this? Everything's belching out noise everywhere all the time. And there's something in their little souls that desires peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. Now, habits can either make great servants or terrible masters. Those habits, those things you do automatically without thinking about them, they can be great servants or terrible masters. And many of us, from a young age, formed habits that weren't so great. We grew up around squawking television sets that were always making noise, droning radios, jangling loud music. Many of us didn't learn to do anything quietly or read quietly or think quietly. We grew up in houses with dinner tables that were busy and loud, where people were arguing over dinner, where family yelled and interrupted us. And that habit became normal to us. And that's a habit that causes problems, physically, spiritually, Imagine riding on a boat your whole life where the rudder was always doing this. And you would just think, well, I guess that's just how it is. <laughs> I don't know. Can it be steady? I've never felt a steady boat before. And we learn from our parents because sometimes we learn the habit of blurting things out. Or, worse yet, just let the rudder go whichever way it wants to go. Don't control that little rudder. Just let it go whatever way it wants to go, especially if you are feeling upset or if you're afraid or nervous or angry or something like that. That, well, you know, control your tongue except when you're feeling angry or afraid or upset. In that case, whatever you want. What would you think if you were in the helm of the ship here and there's a crew there that... Uh, masters and pilots the navigation of this massive ship with hundreds of souls aboard. And uh, you knew that there was one lever that controlled the little rudder, which uh, sort of had the whole destiny of the ship in its hands, whether it would go in a safe direction or not. And someone bursts into the helm room where the controls are, and the person is feverishly angry, and they said, get the pilot off the wheel. I want to be in charge right now and steer the boat. How would you feel about that? I'd say, well, that sounds like a really awful idea. <laughs> I think you should let him keep it. You look a little unsteady. But that's exactly what so many people learn to do as children. As soon as they're angry, they take the wheel and start swinging that little tongue around. When they're angry, when they're afraid. I wouldn't want to be on a boat like that, that was being piloted by someone who was swinging that rudder around with anger, fear. Now, many of us learn those habits. Now, uh, the results in that scenario don't involve an actual cruise ship. They involve your soul and your family's soul and the souls of those around you. And if every time you're angry, you allow your tongue to wag in ways that are unholy, you're going to make shipwreck. Peace and quiet. Those two things come together. You know, I heard a guy a while back, he went through a situation. It was a very difficult situation. Blessed are the peacemakers. He was a child of God. And God had called him to judge a situation. It was a very difficult situation. He was trying to bring peace to all the parties involved. But the thing was, if he said this one thing, he was going to upset this side. And if he said this thing, it was going to upset that side. And it was like really hard to figure out what to say. And the whole thing happened really quick. It was one of those situations that was hard to navigate. We've all found ourselves in a situation like that in life where something happens real quick and you're like, oh, I have to, oh man, I got to say something and this is going to be ugly somehow. I don't know what to say. Now, in this case, the guy had a tremendous advantage. He was a professor of English at a major college and he had mastered the English language. He said he prayed and the guy asked him, they, he was telling this dilemma to somebody else afterwards. And he told them the whole problem. They said, man, that is a pickle. That is, that is a pickle of a problem. He said, well, what did you end up saying? And the guy said, listen, having perfect mastery of the English language, I said nothing. He said he had such a mastery of the English language, he realized the right words to say were nothing mm -hmm. and to be silent. That's an option. Do you know that's an option? 
It's an option for you to hush. You'd get sick living on a boat where the rudder was flopping around every which way, but you're just jacking the thing back and forth. It's okay to be steady and say nothing. It is okay for you to say, hey, do me a favor. This is kind of quick. Would you allow me to pray tonight and get back with you? I'll get back with you, but please give me time to pray and talk to God before I say something back to you. It would be one of the most foolish things you could do to launch a ship on a great journey, to begin a great journey into stormy seas. And speaking when you're angry or upset is like launching a boat into stormy seas and thinking you're going to get a good result. You know what NASA does when the weather's bad? They got a rocket ship down there. They have tons of people watching on TV. They're going to launch a rocket. You know what they do when the weather's bad? Not a good time to launch. Yeah, but all these people are here. All of this, all of this. Not a good time to launch. Well, we're going to we're going to wait for the weather to clear. Are you sure? Don't you want to launch that thing? No, we're going to wait for a good window for this. Timing is important. And sometimes the best thing you can do is go for peace and quiet. Go for a walk. Go for a hike. Talk to God. Sit on a riverbank or an ocean's edge and enjoy the hush. The words peace and quiet are connected. Peace in quiet. Sometimes thinking out loud is not the very best thing you can do. Because when you think out loud, you often embarrass yourself and you spread confusion. And I would suggest to you that uh, one of the biblical concepts of gaining control of that rudder is it's okay to not talk. I'm not telling you to shut up, but I am saying sometimes there's a power in saying the best thing I can do right now is to shut up. What's the second biblical concept? Aim. When you do speak, aim your words. That's a life changer. <laughs> you mean I'm allowed to aim my words and not just blurt them out? Yes, I would recommend it 100% of the time. Every time. You're going to regret not doing it. And you'll give an account for every word that you didn't aim. Aim. Aim your words. Let me ask you this. When you speak, what's the point you're trying to make? What is the likely results from your speaking? What if we cut loose 10,000 ships from Miami and we just cut them loose from the port of Miami and just, just let them drift wherever they went? Well, it would be unlikely that even a single ship would reach port in Sydney, Australia, would it? The only vessel that would make it is a vessel that was intelligently steered and had a clear destination in mind. That's the only vessel that's going to leave Miami and make it to Sydney, Australia. That would be a vessel that was being intelligently piloted with a destination in mind by someone who kept it on course to get there. You could let 10,000 ships drift and just fire them out from New York City. Not even a single ship is going to make it to Miami Beach. In fact, the more that you let loose, they're likely just to crash into each other and cause a bunch of shipwrecks. Because you see, it's not the number of ships that reach their destination, but the careful steering and piloting of each single one. Truth be told, you could uh, let loose just one single ship from New York City, and it could easily make it to Buenos Aires if somebody had clearly in mind that that's where that ship needed to go, and they kept it on course as they were intentionally and intelligently steering it. Now, I bring that up about your words. It's not the more words you say or the less words you say. It's how you aim them and the certain destination that you want them to reach in life. I think it would be silly if there was a person cutting boats loose down there in Charlestown. Is it Charleston, South Carolina? Charleston, South Carolina, just cutting boats loose. And uh, calling over there to the Philippines, like, hey, man, you guys get those boats I cut loose? Oh, I cut hundreds of them loose. None of them drifted over there on their own? Well, I'll go down there today and cut a whole bunch more boats loose, and I'm hoping some of them make it over there. That's a foolish waste of time, isn't it? That's the kind of thing a goofy child would do. <laughs> Forgive me for being so blunt. But when I was a child, I thought as a child... I became a man, I put away childish things. It's not by loosing a bunch of words that you hope that they'll get to their destination. It's by aiming a few correctly. 
what is the aim of what I'm saying right now to this person? Am I trying to encourage them? Am I trying to help them? Am I trying to build them up? What is the aim and my intention? Lord, have your way right now in my lips and my tongue and my thoughts. Do the whole thing. Sing, Lord. Speak to them in your holiness, Christ. Bless them and aim these words so it reaches the destination. This is especially important when you're in a difficult situation with people. When you're in a rough situation, when there's spiritual tension, aim means to study to answer. Proverbs 15 and 28 says, the heart of a righteous man studies to answer, but the mouth of a fool pours out foolishness. Now that doesn't mean that you should talk more, and it doesn't mean you should talk less. It means that when you talk, you should study to answer. Like, what is the likely result of these words to be? I'm not saying you should overthink. Jesus is not saying you should overthink. But some people don't think at all. They're cutting boats loose and just something's going to get somewhere. I just blurred enough out. I know it's going to get to the destination. Sure way to make shipwreck. Aim means to study to answer. It means, what do I want these words to do? Will they build up my neighbor? Will they build up my wife? Will they encourage my husband? Aim your words so that you're in control. And you're not just like, Lord, I hope something good come out of this. Watch this. Blah, 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 blah. Aim the things. You know, I took driver's ed when I was in school. If, if Timothy Jay's out there, I can't remember the name of the vice principal who taught driver's ed, but he was a pretty smart man. Now, I took driver's ed, and I had a teacher who was teaching me to drive, even though I mostly already knew how to drive because I grew up on a farm. And when you grow up on a farm, you learn certain things early because there aren't rules there, and you could just drive around the farm and do what you want. I already knew how to basically drive, but I took driver's ed. I learned a bunch of wonderful things on top of that. And one day, I was riding in the car with another kid named Joshua and a girl named Kat and the teacher. And it was one of the other kids' turns to drive. And her name, God bless her, was Kat. Well, she had never driven before in her life. And when she got behind the wheel, I was in the back seat. And uh, I think as... I want to say Mr. Miller. Mr. The driver's ed teacher kept having to reach over and grab the steering wheel and turn it a little more or a little less because she was almost missing turns, almost hitting fire hydrants and cars. And he had to like literally reach over and do this and this. We finally get on the expressway. Everybody in the car is like white knuckle, you know, like, okay, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> she's never driven before in her life and it shows. And we get on the expressway and the car is weaving in and out and it's going brrr, hitting the rumble strips and everything. Finally, the teacher, the driver's ed teacher reaches over, gets the steering wheel and in a voice and in a voice that was benevolent, but it was firm. And I'll never forget it with a benevolent and firm voice. He says to her, Cat, you have to drive the car. You can't let the car drive you. Do you understand? He says, you have to aim the car. It's not going to drive itself. Do you understand? See, she would make a little turn and like the car was going off the road like there's a cliff coming and she needed to like turn, get on the road and she was getting worse and worse and worse till he would reach over and go, oh, turn the car, what are you doing? She was just hoping it was like a self-driving car or something like that. Now this was back in like 97. It was not a self-driving car. Cat, you have to drive the car. You can't let the car drive you. Do you understand? And he said, you are in control of this car and you need to take control of this car. If it's going out of the lane, get it in the lane. If you're about to hit a car, get away from it. You understand? He said, if there's a car here, steer away, get away. And he began to tell her, you've got to drive the car. You have to tell it where to go. Truth be told, there's a lot of folks that could benefit spiritually from that sage advice about their tongues. When you speak... You can't weave through life just hoping that by carelessly talking and thinking out loud, you're going to get somewhere good. You're probably going to crash a lot. You have got to aim your tongue. You've got to drive it. You've got to say, I can't just sit behind a steering wheel and hope something good comes out. I have to, Lord, have your way in my tongue, me and you together. Speak, Jesus. Don't let the rudder control the ship. 
make sure the ship controls the rudder. You understand what I'm saying there with that? I hope that makes sense to you. The first concept was, if you're not sure what to say, don't say anything. The second concept was, aim your words, be intentional. Now this week, a bridge was taken out by a major vessel and a major bridge because they lost control of that little rudder. And the final thing I would say on the subject is not just to be intentional, but be sure of how you want to use your words. That rudder could have been used to pilot this thing to go feed orphans, or it could be used to destroy a major bridge and kill people. Your tongue is just like that. Be sure about how you want to use it. The Bible says edify one another. What does it mean, edify one another? Build one another up. And I don't think that uh, they intended to destroy that bridge at all. It was a terrible accident. But in many cases, there's neglect. How shall we escape? Let's look at that one. Hebrews comes to mind. I think it's Hebrews 2. Boy, I haven't looked at that verse for a long time. But it comes to mind. Hebrews 2, verse 3. Hebrews 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape? This is a rhetorical question. It's the only question. The only question that God can answer. How shall you escape if you neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How shall we escape? Now, the first verse of that passage, Hebrews 2 and verse 1, it says we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them what? Slip. But that's not what it says in Greek. That's not what it says. It says we ought to give more earnest heed. We ought to pay attention to the things that Jesus has taught, lest at any time we should let them drift away. That's what it says in Greek. Drift. Drifting away. It describes a boat, just nobody's controlling the rudder, and it's just drifting. And then it goes on to say, how will you escape if you're living like that? It won't go well. He's saying, be intentional. Invite the Lord in. The third thing that I would suggest to you is a plain admonishment, that you should choose what side you want to be on. James goes on in a bit of a tirade there in chapter 3. He says, With the tongue you praise the Father, and then you curse men which are made in the very image of God. He says, Out of the same mouth comes praises and cursing. And he says, It shouldn't be so. He says, You've got to decide. He says, Fresh water and salt water can't come from the same spring. He said, A bush grows good fruit and holy fruit. It can't have poisonous fruit on it. He says, You've got to choose what you want to do. And in the context of speaking to others, I would suggest to you, you have like two options there. You can either build other people up or you can tear them down. And you have the power to do both. But you have to choose. There's a proverb that says it's really hard to throw rocks at people when your hands are busy washing feet. You have to choose. And I would suggest to you that if you choose now, Hallelujah. But guess what? You ain't done. You have to choose every hour. You have to choose every minute. You have to choose until your race is over. I've seen it. I know what I'm talking about. You have to get your crown and put it at Jesus' feet many times, many times. And you have to choose the way of holiness, the way of love, the way of upbuilding and foot washing. And you'll have to make that choice afresh every five minutes, every 15 minutes, every hour. You have to choose to build other people up. You have to choose to be merciful to people who don't deserve mercy. You have to choose to turn the other cheek. You have to choose again and again and again to use your tongue only for good and not for evil. The rotten fruits will fall on their own, brothers and sisters. You don't need to take revenge. Those things will take care of itself. Now, many people are celebrating Easter this weekend, and however you feel about Easter celebrations, their timing, their extra-biblical origins, however you feel about that, 
behind all of them is this, the cross of Christ. Easter is allegedly, the crux of it is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of someone who used his tongue in the closing moments of his earthly life to bless and not to curse. To say, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Have mercy on them. This was a man that in his case was in tremendous pain and turmoil, struggling and bearing a terrible iniquity that wasn't his. It was quite unfair. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And because of what Jesus did, we can have abundant life. A life right now that cannot be taken from us and will not be taken from us. I read a story this week about an awful fire that took place in England a few centuries ago. Terrible fire. And the flames spread quickly from the house to the entire plantation nearby. And it spread so badly. The flames spread so badly with so frosty that they burned even the trees and the bushes. Just everything. Just burned and charred. Wiped the entire thing out. Hundreds of acres. The owner and his family were praying people. And they had the good fortune in the favor of God that they made it out alive. When they returned back the next day. They found the entire plantation burned to the ground from one fence post to another. Not a piece of it was untouched. And the owner and his family were standing there surveying the scene of desolation. And they heard the chirping of little birds in the blackened thicket next to them. So the owner searched among the charred branches and he discovered a nest on which was laying with outstretched wings a dead robin. The flames had gotten her. But underneath of her, there were three fledglings safe and sound. The mother bird had covered her young and lost her life to save them. Now that is not the story of Easter, but it is very close. And it's a beautiful story that contains the spirit of the gospel. Greater love has no man than this, that he might lay down his life for that of his friends. The Father has sent Jesus to cover us, to carry us, to spread forth his arms, to shelter us. What he did on the cross is enough for each one of us. And for that reason, he is worthy for worship. He is worthy to be worshiped. He's worthy to be adored and praised. What he did for us is enough. And if that's some good news, here's some better news. Jesus is not on the cross any longer. Neither is he in the tomb. He is risen. He's a resurrected Savior, and he wants to be part of your life, and he wants to live with you. Spiritually, he wants to come into you, and he would like to speak through your words to others. If he would die for you, isn't it enough that you would allow him to speak words of mercy and goodness and beauty and love through your life, through your lips? When you be tempted to spew anger and bitterness and hatefulness at others, wouldn't it be more wonderful to let him have his way in you. And I ask you this week, brothers and sisters, if you be tempted to speak an angry word, a fearful word, an impatient word, then speak to Jesus first and ask him to steer the rudder of your tongue so that you don't make shipwreck. God will help you. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, forgive our sins. Forgive our trespasses. Forgive our debts, Lord. We thank you for what the Son of God has done for us. We thank you for that spirit of the gospel which has 
drenched with the ancestral stiticisms of generations of love that could not be quenched or stopped, but rose into a crescendo at Calvary. We thank you, Father, for every mother bird who spared her young, for every firefighter who went in when others came out, for every good person who lived for something larger than themselves. Lord, I believe it is enough. I know that what Christ has done is enough. I pray that people would behold the cross this weekend in their Easter services, in their church services, in state parks, national parks, traffic jams, diners, waffle houses, grocery stores, nightclubs, pornographic theaters, Lord. Wherever they are, I pray that you would call them from their sins to the cross. That they could behold the wonderful Son of God. I know, Father, you're not afraid to shine your light into sinners and call them into saints. We pray you would do just that. that people would behold the cross, be moved by its power, that Christ be lifted up, that they be released and forgiven of their debts and enter into a new life. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I love you guys. Let me look at the comments here. Alejandro, thank you for coming. Uh, Oh, oh, I just say this now every week. Like and subscribe, that's a thing. I didn't used to say it, but uh, the numbers have been going up and it has become apparently clear uh, that the more subscribers, the more they show it to, and then that might be more people that get helped. So if you haven't subscribed, we would love to have you. Alejandro, if, I've never, if you've never been here before, I've only known one Alejandro in my life, so I don't think you're him. His name was Ramirez. Welcome, Alejandro, and thank you for coming. Um, and Handyman Hensley, I'll get back to your messages. Man, I had a moment earlier. Hey, let me tell you guys this. I love each and every one of you, and that's not flattery. I mean sincerely. I, like, love you guys. I do. And sometimes I'm, like, messages on top of messages. I'll have, like, people with me in person and someone calling on FaceTime and three unanswered messages. And so I triage and there's times when I say, okay, this got to be right now. This got to wait. This is, and I ask the Lord what he wants me to do. That doesn't mean you're not important. It means that sometimes there's like a stack of like, and I'll tell you, um, I earnestly have sought to do my best. And there's been some long days. There's been days of 7 a.m. up and midnight going to bed and long days where you always have a few people with you or you're carrying somebody the whole time. And so if I haven't answered your message right away, forgive me. It's not that I'm ignoring you. I love you. It's probably that there's a couple people with me in person or I'm literally carrying lumber on my back and there's somebody with me in person or, you know, whatever's happening like that. And so it's not that I'm ignoring you. And Handyman Hensley, I, when you called today, man, I had like several people in person and several messages ringing at the same time. And I was like, I can't do it. Stephanie Clayton, thank you for coming and joining. Khadija, it is beautiful to see you as always. Um, tomorrow we'll be back at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oh, nope, okay. Yes, my wife corrected me. Thank you. Noon tomorrow, because we have guests here with us. My in-laws are here, so praise God for that. Kenny and Rose are right across from me, and I'm grateful they're here. Um, so we're going to be able to spend time with them. So noon tomorrow, because we have a thing scheduled in the afternoon. And so locally, we're going to have some, we're going to be at bright side and that sort of thing. So noon, we'll be live streaming tomorrow. Join, come back. We love you. For those who asked about supporting the ministry, we'd be thrilled. Pray. Pray. Do that first. And if you can help financially, I, I wouldn't ask if we didn't need it. I love you guys. We got bills due. We got things due. And we're traveling and, you know, Someone works for a conference, for example, as a pastor, they make legitimately 80000 a year, legitimately, plus health insurance, plus they have uh, per diem, 
like when they travel, they don't have to pay for gasoline and stuff. We don't have anything like that. If you see a cruise ship, we paid for the cruise ship. If you see gasoline, we paid for the gasoline. If you see uh, we give something away, we paid for that. And it's not us. It's God that does it. But, you know, anyway, I love you guys. We've got some travels coming up in the camp meeting. Praise God, a donation came today and covered a big chunk of the camp meeting. Um, anyway, I love you guys. We can get you the information if you're interested in supporting uh, because we had two people message and ask about it. And I need to figure a way to drop that information on the live stream so people can see it. We'll be back tomorrow at noon. Until then, God bless.